Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. It's going to start this way. <laughs> on a fiery one for our fiery speaker tonight. Ain't no grave.
believer in Jesus Christ struggles with anger and self-medication. My name is Mike. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery. The purpose of Celebrate Recovery is to allow us to become free from life's herbs, life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. By working through the eight principles of recovery based on the Beatitudes, we can and will change. We, be, we will begin to experience the true peace and serenity that we have been seeking. Through this program, we will restore and develop stronger relationships with others. I'm skipping the next section. <laughs> Just so we'll take care of some house, housekeeping. Restrooms. Smokers, we love you. No judgment. Take it to the street. <clears throat> Cell phones, silence them. At the literature table. No, it's supposed to be Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, special announcements, lady. Nada? Nothing? You don't want to come up here and just say hi? Hey, Forever Family. Um, so announcements are step study. If, if men, if you're interested in a step study, talk to this guy or Tim. And women, if you're interested in a step study, talk to me or Tammy. That's all I got. Oh yeah, uh, uh, see our leaders, um, bef right before we go break into our men's and women's groups, we're gonna have a one minute meeting right there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to call up the Canadian Connection as my readers. They're like the Canadian mob. They may shoot you, they may hurt you, but they'll say they're sorry and take you to a hockey game. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> so we're out and about. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. My name is Freya, and I'm in recovery for alcohol addiction and codependency. Hi. <laughs> and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I'm here originally for sexual issues, specifically pornography and people pleasing. And my name is Paul. Hi, Paul. Step one. We admitted we were powerless over our addictive and compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7.18 Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2.13 We made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12.1 Number four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3.40 Number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5.16 Number six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. James 4.10 Number seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Number eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. We made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so, do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. 
first go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, verses 23, 24. Number 10, we continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Number 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. And number 12, having had an spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6.1. Through God's, God's grace, grace lasting, lasting change, change is, is possible. possible. Yay. Yay. Well, good evening. It is great to be back at Choose Recovery tonight. And uh, it's like a high school reunion. Come and celebrate, hang out with the alumni. Well, my name is Greg Malky, and I'm a Christ follower recovering from alcoholism. Let's open with a quick prayer. Uh, Father God, we just thank you for each and every person you have gathered in this room tonight. And we pray that your spirit will fall upon each and every one of us and uh, continue to bless us. You've got us here to now. That means there's more in store for us. So we thank you for loving us. It's in our, your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank Arlene and the team for inviting me out tonight. You know, like I said, it's great to be back here. I've been a part of Celebrate Recovery uh, since 2001, their first year here. A um, little qualifier, my sobriety date is um, April 7, 2000. I have a home group. It's the Meat and Potatoes. We meet every Wednesday night. I have a sponsor. He has a sponsor, and he has a sponsor, and I sponsor guys. So there is genealogy out there in this sponsorship thing. So to my story, um, I was born and raised in a middle-class family in Virginia. Uh, we had everything we needed and a few extra perks. I had horses. We had boat, camper. We went on some good, nice vacations. However, one thing about that family, we never went to church except weddings and funerals. Speaking of weddings, I was at my cousin's wedding. This is in December of 72. I just turned 10 years old. And uh, the bride's brother, he was about two years older than me, smuggled a bottle of champagne off the tables into a coat closet. And he says, come here, I want to show you something. And he says, here, try this. I drank it. It didn't taste too bad. After a little while, I started to feel pretty good. And there was probably about a half a bottle left in there, and we polished it off and went back to our table. And my mother had a full glass of champagne sitting in front of her. And so after about 20 or 30 minutes, actually it was about two minutes, I picked that glass up and drank about half of it. And uh, then about another half hour later, probably two minutes, I picked it up and finished it off. Now, we were leaving for the night, and I noticed somebody, as we're leaving, left a full glass of that funny juice on the table over here. So when everybody was outside, I made an excuse to go back inside, and I polished off that glass of champagne. Um, three things happened to me that night. Number one, I drank alcohol. I loved the way it made me feel. Number two, I lied about how much I'd been drinking. Let me taste that. And then I went to any length to get more of it. Little did I know, I was exhibiting alcoholic behavior because I was only 10 years old. Can anybody identify with that? Um, so I'm going to skip the drunk log. We all have a past. Okay, it's what got us here tonight. So here we're trying to get better tonight. So I'm just going to go all the way up to my last drink. And uh, on April 7th, 
of 2000, I was coming out of a liquor store with my third half gallon of whiskey for the day. And I put that bottle on the car seat and I heard a voice that says, you can't keep doing this. And I looked behind me to see who had crawled in my car because I heard a voice. There was nobody there. I looked at that bottle and I just said, I can't keep doing this. I closed my eyes and said the first sincere three word prayer of my life. I said, God help, help me. That was the closest I'd ever come to surrendering, admitting defeat, or asking for help. Now, shortly after that prayer, I was arrested for my last DUI. Um, up until that point, my resume, as I like to call it, included a failed marriage, a lousy relationship with my biological son, um, two lost houses, four lost very well-paying corporate jobs, I had wrecked 16 automobiles, I had racked up 12 alcohol-related arrests, and that night I was arrested for my seventh DUI. I knew I was going to away for a while because this was my third DUI in 13 months. I had not fulfilled my court obligation on the other two. Um, incidentally, my attorney and I share the last, same last name. And the last meeting we had with my prior DUI, he just looked at me and he says, Greg, he said, you need to do something about your drink. And I said, yeah, I know. I'll try to do better. So in a very short time, I was moved into a gated community in which I would reside for the next 16 months. <laughs> that is where God introduced me to two of the most influential men that I would ever meet. The first one is Brother K. And I, I refer to him as Brother K. He was walking down the hallway one day, and he stopped and looked into my cell, and this is on day eight of my incarceration. I skipped the part. I went through seven days of horrific withdrawals. I would never remember anything else. But on my first day of clarity, he looks in and says, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm in here. You're out there. Why don't you figure it out? He just said, would you like to talk about it? I said, you got a while? He said, I've got all day long. So I sat up on my bunk, and I, I said, well, I'm here because of my drinking. And I guess it started when I was 10 years old. And as I told him my story, I could see where alcohol, I was actually telling myself my story. I could see that every time alcohol was involved was when I was at my lowest. And I like to say that I didn't get in trouble every time I drank, but every time I got in trouble, I'd been drinking. Amen. So, I guess it was probably an hour or so with him, and in the end, he asked me, he, he told me, you don't have to feel this way anymore. I said, I don't. And he said, no, you can give it all to Jesus right now. He led me to the Christ, and he began nurturing me, what I call spoon-feeding me. He brought me a Bible. He smuggled one in. He smuggled a Bible in. Then he smuggled in a daily bread, and I found out later all you got to do is ask for him. <laughs> now, as I began to think with a little bit of clarity, I remember that alcohol was the reason I was here, and it took me back to my, the days when I was going to AA meetings, and it was by choice. The judge chose to tell me to go to alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous. My wife chose to send me there. My employer eventually sent me there by their choice. I didn't do much of what they said, but I did remember. Those guys were happy. Um, so I began requesting AA meetings to where we were in that community, to the community administrators. And uh, they kept saying, we don't have volunteers. And I wrote back one last time. I said, can you just tell them I'm serious this time? <laughs> it wasn't much longer after that I heard AA in the gym, five minutes. And I'm like, they're here. And that's where I met three more men who were a very big influence in my life, Bruce, Fish, and Jim. They came in every single Wednesday night, and they brought a message of hope to me every single Wednesday night, including Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. When I said they wouldn't be there, Christmas Eve, I walked up, and I was looking at Bruce. He's sitting in a chair like this. And I said, do they pay you extra to come in on holidays? And he says, they don't pay us to come in here. I'm like, why do you do it? 
And he said, this is how we stay sober. And it began to start making sense to me. So I let them know when I was being released, they told me exactly what to do. Now, when I was released, I got off the property of that gated community, and I stopped and paused for a minute. And I looked back at that building, and I made a promise to God. I said, if you can get me back in there to carry the same message of hope that was delivered to me, I will go. <clears throat> Later on that night, I was at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and lo and behold, there was a gentleman sitting right across from me that I'd known from about 25 years earlier, and he was a partying fool. I even partied with him. And this man picked up an 18-year medallion. And I said, my gosh, if he can do it, I can do it. He continued nurturing me a little bit, and I was still up in Virginia until I moved to Florida. And uh, you see, my sister had been writing to me, telling me about this church she had found. It was a Methodist church, had a Puerto Rican pastor. He was in recovery, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds awful. <laughs> so I moved to Cape Coral, Florida. <laughs> So that night, Sherry induced, introduced me to a man who would go on to become my first sponsor. And he, um, a lot of you remember John. The man was hard as a rock on the outside, but he was soft as a marshmallow on the inside. He had a passion for men trying to get better. And he shared that passion and gave me everything I needed. Um, so I've told you what it was like. And I've told you what happened. So now I'm going to explain to you about what I do to maintain what I have now. Um, one night in 2002, I was at my home group, and uh, I guess my, my sponsor was beside me, and about two chairs down, my grand sponsor was sitting there, and he always sat here like this, just like Bruce used to do in jail. And uh, I guess he noticed I was getting a little uptight, and he just kind of leaned forward and says, Greg... He says, all you have to do is go to meetings, use your sponsor, work the steps, get involved in service, and trust God with the results. And eventually, you will begin to look at life differently. And I said, that's all there is to it? He said, that's all there is to it. And I'm like, well, I'll be darned. I've probably told that story about a hundred times since then. And a lot of you remember him. Some of you may know him. I know Arlene remembers him. Dave Sherman. This guy was a walking model of Alcoholics Anonymous. So these are what I have always referred to as the five non-negotiables. And praise God, Choose Recovery is doing these exact same things right now. So the first thing he told me to do is make sure you go to meetings. Well, my first sponsor was taking me to about six or seven meetings a week, and we weren't going on Wednesday night. That's because it was his date night. And in recovery meetings, it's where we all understand that we need each other. Okay? And my sponsor got me in the habit of going to a lot of meetings because he was helping me to make a habit of going to meetings. And uh, he told me to pick a home group, make a commitment to serve in there, and I began serving in that group. And the next thing that Dave said was use your sponsor. Now, my first sponsor told me that when, I, when he agreed to be my sponsor, when I asked, finally, got the nerve to ask him, um, they told me, he says, call me tomorrow. And so the next day, came and went, and I said, well, I'll see John tonight. I don't need to call him. And he came by to pick me up for a meeting. And he says, you didn't call me today. And I said, well, I knew I was going to see you tonight. What's the big deal? He says, when I asked you, what were you willing to do? What did you say? And I says, anything. He says, then call me every day. And that's when I began to understand that sometimes in recovery, we're going to have to do things we're not comfortable with. And especially the men, I can probably assure you, it's, it's tough to pick up the phone and call another man. So then I started calling him every day, and it got a lot easier. We worked the steps together. He worked me through my first couple of fourth steps, 
And uh, actually, we went through several four steps together. And uh, on the other end of having a good sponsor is when you have a good sponsor, you learn how to be a good sponsor. And I believe it when I hear it when it said, if you don't have a sponsor, you should not be sponsoring anybody. One reason is you're not going to have all the answers. Sometimes you're going to call up line and get the right answers. So the third thing Dave Sherman mentioned that night, we saw all these on the screen earlier. You can't make this stuff up. So as with anything, if you want to succeed, you're going to have to practice. Lots of practice. And constantly going through the steps keeps you razor sharp. It keeps you on top of your game. And my current sponsor put it to me this way. He said, you've got to stay razor sharp. If you want to slice a tomato, you want that knife to be razor sharp. He says, and make nice, pretty, beautiful, thin slices. He says, if you've got a dull knife, you're just going to make a mess out of that tomato. I'm like, hmm, that's one good way to look at it. Um, I've chosen my current home group, which is the meat and potatoes, and we use the 12 steps and the 12 traditions as our literature. And that takes us through the 12 steps every 14 weeks. That's like three step studies a year. Now that's keeping myself involved in the steps. That's why I chose that group. And as far as my fourth step, first time around, I learned that the better I clean house, the more room there is for God to work with me. And my current sponsor today, every time I call him, it's not every day, but I do call him very often. And at the end of every phone call, he says, how's your 10th and 11th step? And that's when our talk gets serious. You know, am I continuing to take personal inventory? And am I working step 11, improving my conscious contact with God and that's what we call it my conscious contact with God so the fourth thing that I have to do is get involved in service now my second Friday here my first Friday at Celebrate Recovery was my first full day in Cape Coral and I walked through those same front doors by the end of the night I said I'm home i had been reading the Bible while I was in that community, I'd been reading the AA literature and I saw how they went together. And I had already preconceived this. So I walked through the doors, I'm like, they stole my idea. How <laughs> dare them? Then I had a moment of clarity. I said, they've done all the hard work. <laughs> I get to enjoy it. So by the second week, I had my first title. I was a refreshment coordinator. That meant I was a coffee maker. <laughs> but in, in, inside of the first year, year and a half I was here, I was helping Sherry, my sister, who's here tonight. I was helping her with the literature table. I um, was helping Bill uh, facilitate a men's group. Um, I was facilitating large group. I, was teach, I began teaching lesson. And there is not a service opportunity here at Choose Recovery that I have not done. I've done them all. Now, when I'm serving, I sometimes have to show up early. And that's when you really get to know people a little bit better. And you find out you have things in common with these people. And this is where I have met some of the closest friends I have today, is in the rooms of recovery. Do you remember the promise I made to God back in 2001? If you can get me in there, as if God can't. In 2003, I began taking meetings for Alcoholics Anonymous into the Lee County Jail. I did that for three years, and in 2006, I was asked to join Cairo's prison ministries. Except for a time that I had committed a large commitment here at Celebrate Recovery, I've been serving there since 2006. Now, the last one is trust God with the results. You know, I've learned it's okay to make plans as long as you don't plan the outcome. Um, if I do that, I'm letting myself, I'm setting myself up for a letdown. Now, God's plans for all of us is more than we could ever imagine. And sometimes I will shortchange myself when I try to play God. Now, for the first 37 years of my life, I couldn't imagine a relationship with God. 
today, I wouldn't want to imagine my life without a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. I keep my bucket full by starting my devotions. Um, I do daily devotions, and I don't pray daily. I pray every day, all day long. I pray all day long. And I've heard it said best that when God wakes you up in the morning and gives you another day, the best response you can do is, thank you, God. What can I do for you? Um, I just want to take a moment, and I, I, I'm very, very involved in service, and I just want to thank, first of all, my wife for coming out and supporting me tonight, Daniil. You all know her. We started dating in 2002 and three and four and five and six. <laughs> And people kept saying, when are you going to get make it right with that girl? When are you going to put a ring on her finger? And I said, the answer was always the same. When she knows exactly who I am, what I do, and why I do it. And she has never met drunk Greg. And she doesn't want to meet drunk Greg. She's happy with sober Greg. But with all the service work that I do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift you up right now. She has never batted an eye when I said, I've got a commitment that night, or that this week I am out of the house five nights, you know, and it's all in serving God. So, Daniil, I love you. Thank you for what you allow me to do. And I'm going to close with my favorite Bible verse. Um, it's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And I was reading the Bible in a year, and it was about year three before I stumbled across this thing. They didn't have it in there before. They just put it in. Uh... Isn't it funny how that happens? But this is my life verse. And it says, In the God of all grace, who deliver you to eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore you to make you firm, strong, and steadfast. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. My name is Greg Malky. I am a Christ follower recovering from alcoholism. I want to thank you all and thank Arlene for letting me share tonight. God bless you. Thank you, John. Wow. He's good. I haven't done this in a while. Anyway. <laughs> okay. With that being said, and I'm looking around the room, I can skip the next part. So we're going to close tonight with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer in its entirety, as soon as I find it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is and not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Y'all know where you're going. Leaders, meet over here. Rest of you, head to your rooms. We'll catch up. <laughs>